Hi, welcome to Bookmark. I'm your host, Don Noble. Today's guest is John Meacham, who has written of the relationship between giants, Winston Churchill and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and biographies of Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson. His American lion, Andrew Jackson in the White House, won the Pulitzer Prize. Now he has completed his biography of George H.W. Bush, our 41st president, who is still very much alive and whose place in history has yet to be decided. Please join me at the Alabama Booksmith as I talk with biographer John Meacham. Mr. Major, it's a pleasure to see you. Delighted to be here. I've been reading your work for years. I'm a fan. You're the one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a pleasure to meet you in person. Thank you. The newest book, the biography of George H.W. Bush, came out a few weeks ago, and it was the ink was still wet, and you were being interviewed on Sunday morning and, and uh, other kinds of news and talk shows. And I watched it, and I had this strong impression, one, that the people speaking with you had not yet read your book, <laughs> except for three or four pages towards the end, pages 585, 586, and 587, where uh, Bush 41 said a few things characterizing his son's presidency, his opinion of <laughs> Dick Cheney, and his present long-lasting opinion of, of Donald Rumsfeld. That's right. Let's just put that behind us. Sure. What did... George H.W. have to say about those three things? The president was worried that his son's administration was too swaggering, uh, that there was a cowboy image, uh, that the president was ultimately responsible for it, but in 41's view, Rumsfeld and Cheney uh, exacerbated it. Uh, everyone was a grown-up in it. Uh, president Bush made these comments, breaking years of silence about uh, his, his son's administration. Uh, when I took them to 43, he said, well, my rhetoric was hot, you know, but they understood me in Midland, uh, which I thought was a good response. Uh, and true. And true, and true. It had the virtue of being true. Uh, Cheney said, yes, I was different after September 11th because the strategic environment had changed. Uh, Rumsfeld chose not to comment on the record. Um, so um, you're right. I, it was a, uh, but one of the funny things, when, when President Bush first made those remarks in October of 2008, it was a Monday morning interview, I remember, I knew in that moment that I would spend the first three days of when, whenever this book was published <laughs> talking about those comments. So, Yes, and, and, and the book coming out in, in the frenzy of the, of the primary season here, right. I mean, it's just, it's, just, it's just perfect. Yeah, well, yeah, gas on the, gas on the flames there. But, but the book, yeah, as you, uh, implicit in your question, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, is this, this, I really wanted President Bush to have his moment here, uh, have a full dress life. Uh, because I think it's a great American life that is uh, very little understood. It is a, it is a, a, a slice of Americana, but it's, it, it's uh, as with some presidents, it's a very, it's a very, um, very high-end slice. Very privileged slice, <laughs> very yes. Privileged yes. Slice. It's like FDR, it's like JFK. Um, yeah. uh, more like culturally and temperamentally, he has a great deal in common with the founding presidents who were Virginia planters in many ways. For whom people for whom the make the making of a living was not a central concern, which gave you the ability, the free space to um, treat public service as part of your ambient responsibility. And so there was never any doubt, really, uh, but that Poppy Bush, uh, as he was known as a child, was going to do something involving public service. You have written about Franklin Roosevelt. I love the the Franklin Roosevelt yeah. Winston Churchill friendship. I think that's just I miss the boys. It's, that was fun. <laughs> it's really nice. Uh, and Jefferson and Jackson. And in a way, these are these are very different people. But they're all <clears throat> president of the United States. So they all obviously had powers and, and, and uh, capabilities of leadership. The same ones? When you, here you are with four presidents. Yeah. What do they have in common? And how is Bush the same or different from Jackson, say? Well, what they have in common is the perennial tension between ambition, appetite, versus service and duty. Mm -hmm. And 
it's, it's a matrix, you know, it's all, they're all mixed together. It's not, it's not a Manichaean struggle uh, for any of them, which is why it's fascinating. Uh, you know, very few, you know, there are some figures for whom that is a Manichaean struggle, but, but these, these men, it's not. Um, they also all wanted to leave the country in a better place than they found it, and they wanted to leave their thumbprint on the country. So they wanted to improve it, but they wanted it to be clear who had done the improving. <laughs> Uh, and so, um, as I said to President Bush once, you know, what drove you? He said, service. I said, that's fine, sir, but you know, you could have opened a soup kitchen. You know, you didn't have to seek ultimate responsibility in a nuclear age uh, to serve. And he acknowledged that and acknowledged he was a very driven man. Uh, it had come from his childhood. Uh, his mother was fiercely competitive. She once broke her wrist playing tennis and finished the match and won. Uh, these were tough, tough people, uh, the Bushes and the Walkers. But, uh, but Jackson, Jefferson, uh, Roosevelt, Bush were all quintessentially political creatures. They were those who required, in their very heart and soul, they required a large stage on which to act out what they thought was their destiny. And for some of them, <clears throat> they had lineage to mm -hmm. start off their destiny. I, I was astonished. The Bushes were Mayflower people. Yep. The Walkers were 17th century people. Yep. Yep. And then and then, and Barbara Pierce's family was almost oh, yeah. as distinguished and richer in some ways mm -hmm. than, mm -hmm. than, than the Walkers and the Bushes. Um, that, those ancestors of George H. W. Uh, uh, Episcopalian priest, uh, bankers, uh, uh, man who owned an iron factory, industrialists, industrialists, yeah. and of course his father. Now, what, what his father was the senator from Connecticut at, at one point. Is that the, the direct? Is that the real direct link? Well, I think so. Prescott Bush, uh, who was the son of the president of Buckeye Steel Castings, had grown up in Columbus, Ohio, had come east to school, mm -hmm. St. George's, uh, and and Yale. Uh, was really kind of an early private equity guy, uh, Brown Brothers Harriman, a private bank. But the thing that really gave him a lot of joy was being the moderator of the Greenwich Town Meeting. And, <laughs> and so right. that's where it all began. Right. That's where it all began. And ultimately, uh, uh, he became senator. He lost his first race. It's funny, he went, they wanted to know if he wanted to run for the House, and he went to his Brown Brothers partners, and they, they considered being a partner at Brown Brothers Harriman to be more influential in the world than being a member of the House of Representatives, which gives you some sense of their own self-regard <laughs> yes, <right>. about <laughs> privilege. Uh, so, but it, it was about, um, it was in many ways about his dad. Uh, his, his, um, his father first ran in 1950, uh, won in 52, uh, and Bush, uh, George H.W. Bush, by the time he was 40, uh, was running for the U.S. Senate in Texas. Yeah, before he was forty, thirty-nine. Yeah. His childhood. I mean, it it it's a it's lovely. It's enviable. Yes. <laughs> his sister told me. His sister said, "Unimaginable now. Unimaginable now." I guess. I guess uh, there's still a Phillips Andover. There's still yeah. Choate. There's a, people still go. But, the, the, but the, the the servants who would show up at the hunting lodge and light uh, the fires and all of that. Uh, but I do think he took away a, a Rooseveltian sense of to whom much is given, much is expected. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, they were not spoiled. They were privileged, uh, but they were not entitled. They were not spoiled. And when you think about the, the demographics of that family, it's remarkable that um, from generation to generation, these have been whole people. Uh, they haven't been reckless uh, yeah. when you think about it. Right. Duty, honor, country. He finishes prep school. Turns 18 and joins the Navy. On the same day. Um, yes. <laughs> wonderful. Just yeah. wonderful. Putting off <clears throat> his inevitable time at Yale. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. Right. Yes. The, 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 way, the way I'd like to frame this is, in the course of his political career, there's a period of time when he's accused of being a swaggerer. Then there's a period of time when he's accused of being a wimp. Right. Then there's another period of time when he's running against Dukakis, where he's again the cowboy, right. <laughs> the big guy from the West, and Dukakis is somehow cast as a as an elitist from the Northeast. Right. Well, they could have been a bigger elitist from the Northeast than, than, George, <laughs> than Bush. George Bush. But but his his World War II experiences. I mean, he was a remarkable young man. 
He was. Uh, by the time he was, tw- he was, he was probably the youngest flying officer in the Navy. Yeah. Um, that's something that's always been said of him. Uh, he, uh, on September 2nd, 1944, uh, he was shot down over the Pacific. Uh, he finished a mission even after his plane had been hit. The wings of the plane went up in uh, flames, the cockpit filled with smoke. Uh, he took out the tower he was supposed to take out, goes back out to sea. He loses his two crewmates, Del Delaney and Ted White were their names. Uh, he plunges deep into the Pacific. He's almost decapitated coming out of the plane. Um, he's out there for four hours waiting for a submarine to pick him up. If the wind and the tide had been going toward Chichijima as opposed to away from it, he would have become a Japanese prisoner of war on an island where war crimes were particularly horrific, including cannibalism. So uh, at, d- at various moments through the years, Bush sa- has said, well, you know, I was almost in hors d'oeuvre. Um, so uh, it's- I never heard that. At 20 years old, all that. And, and then the, the other tragedy that I think shaped him, uh, so that happens when he's 20. Um, by the time he's 33, 32, they lose their daughter to leukemia. And so when I ask him about what all this had taught him, uh, he just had a much more a keener appreciation of the fragility of life and death than most of us do, and a much deeper emotional complexity than most of us do. And he said that what, particularly what his daughter's death had taught him, was that life was unpredictable and fragile. It is touching in that, in your biography, that it's very clear, not only did he never get over it, but it becomes an almost a George Patton kind of mystical experience. He, he, he imagines. I don't mean dreams it, but, but she's present. Yes. She's a she's a kind of a spiritual presence from yes. time to time. Yes. Uh, the, that's the way he, the, the he coped. Yes, Robin. That's the way he, she she died when she died at the age of four. And um, the way the president coped was to imagine her at different ages, at different stages yeah. of life. Um, they'll be buried with her. Uh, in College Station uh, at the President's Library. Uh, they uh, reinterred her remains from Greenwich um, some years ago. And it's, 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 it fundamentally sh- uh, shaped the family, and I think it had a great deal to do with Bush's hectic, frenetic, headlong pace. Um, life could be taken away at any point, so there wasn't a moment to waste. And now he's 90. 90- one or two. <laughs> 91 and a half years old. 91 and a half. And still going. You know, did the coin toss of the NFL game in right. Houston the other day. Right. He, when the war ends, he comes out. Then he goes to Yale. Right. Skull and bones, Phi Beta Kappa, two and a half years. Yep. It's almost... I... He, he, you made it perfectly clear many times that this is a man in a hurry. Yeah. But I swear, I... If I had been a Bush at Yale, I wouldn't have been in such a rush. Rush to get into the real world. No, it was that's true. But you know, it's imagine piloting. I mean, he was a carrier-based pilot yeah. at that age. That was in the dawn of that kind of aviation, um, and he just wanted to get a family going. Uh, yeah. You know, he, he, that generation. As his son once put it, I think in his acceptance speech in 2000, that his father was part of the generation that came home and put their medals in a drawer and went to work. And um, in summer of 1948, he strikes out for Texas to make his own fortune. He has immense support from his family, but he still had to make his own payrolls, find the oil. Uh, So George Bush always benefited from being George Bush. There's no question about that. But within that context, he took extraordinary risks to get himself out of the comfort zone of the Northeast. And he lived purposely, modestly, yes. when he went out to Odessa and to Midland. I love the little bit where he and Barbara and George W. are sharing a kind of a duplex house with a mother-daughter prostitute team. Yes. And they share the bathroom. They share the bathroom, and then sometimes the the gentleman callers would leave the bathroom door locked, which which caused. So they they were exposed to the entrepreneurial class early, uh, is one way. <laughs> the of mother think. and daughter. Yes, exactly. I read that paragraph twice. I swear, I thought this, this mother can't be true. mother daughter really. <laughs> and and Barbara Bush is sharing a bathroom with two hookers. Yeah, there you go. There so you go. to speak. There you go. Would it, would it be offensive to say that this this. Um, is a kind of willful, um, he had plenty of money, or he could have had plenty of yeah. money, 
But he, was, he is determined to live like a common fellow who just finished college on the GI Bill? Well, he wanted to make it on his own. I think that, yeah. I think that love was unconditional in the Bush family, but respect was earned. Admiration uh -huh. was earned. Right. And so you wanted to win the tennis match. You wanted to win the golf tournament. Uh, it wasn't that it was <laughs> brutal, but the whole ethos of the family has this kind of muscular Christianity uh, idea that athletics, business success, these are all, one's success in the world is in fact a measure of, into some sense, some degree of character. And so he wanted, as he said, we came to Texas because we wanted to make a lot of money quick. Uh, he wanted, he didn't want to go to Wall Street. He would have been in the shadow of his father and his grandfather. I mean, George Herbert Walker Bush, G.H. Walker and Company was one of the jobs on offer. He right. writes a letter uh, to uh, one of his buddies saying that he does, doesn't want to take advantage of the fact that he knows everybody from the debutante parties and go raise money from them. That he just saw that as a conventional path that was not going to be challenging enough. Not, he, he once said it wasn't different, his big left hand, it wasn't different enough, it wasn't different <laughs> enough. And he wanted, he wanted something different. And one of the things, that, an overall familial point, is that the Bushes we talk about and know about and the Walkers we talk about and know about are not those who took a conventional path, but those who took an unconventional path. G.H. Walker broke with his father's business, a dry goods business in St. Louis. Uh, Samuel Prescott Bush, who ran Buckeye Steel, his father had been a priest. Uh, he wanted to get out of the world of the scholarship and theology. And George H.W. Bush wanted to make it on his own so that uh, Prescott Bush would look at him with respectful eyes. In, in a lot of your, well, a lot of biographies of, of famous and powerful men, but especially in the biographies you've written, Daddy figures large. Yeah. Winston's Daddy, um, Franklin's Daddy, George H.W.'s yeah. father. Fathers well, really matter. They absolutely. And in fact, I once interviewed President Obama about this very question because uh, presidents tend to either have a dominant father figure or no father at all. There's almost no in between. Uh -huh. So if you think about recent history, Barack Obama and Bill Clinton both right. were without fathers. Uh, George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush both had powerful fathers. So the last four presidents, you can tell the story. Um, President Reagan had a, a unreliable father, uh, an alcoholic. Um, and President Obama said that he always thought that sons were always either trying to live up to their father's expectations or make up for their father's mistakes. What is Bill Clinton doing? <laughs> uh, well, he's probably doing both, as ever. Uh, he's got a big appetite, so. Bush's years as oh, head of the National Republican Committee, envoy to China, head of the CIA, then eight years as vice president. It's really, it's like he's the crown prince or something, waiting and waiting and waiting for the moment to come. And it finally does come, but I got the sense that there was a terrific tension. He was loyal, mm -hmm. kept his mouth shut, followed the party line. Mm -hmm. Must have been excruciating for somebody who wanted to be. He wanted to be in charge. Yeah. Really in charge, charge of everything. I mean, yeah. he was in charge of the CIA. He was, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, you know, but well, so you know, stressful. It was stressful. I think of those years as almost a second military career for him, uh, uh -huh. where he was going from <laughs> posting to posting uh, and sort of preparing for command. Um, now, as you know, there was a, it was touch and go always. Uh, you know, there, wasn't, there was no guarantee that there was going to be the next job. Right. And in fact, he very nearly did not become vice president. Uh, if Reagan and Ford could have struck their deal, uh, which would have put Ford on the ticket uh, in 1980, then there would have been no Bush vice presidency and there would have been no Bush presidency. Right. It was the eight years of loyalty. Of absolute loyalty that, to Reagan. Right. Uh, and and then, and also a very shrewd campaign in 1988 that was uncharacteristic of him uh, in terms of his, you know, he is a gentlemanly, gracious figure, but he did not run, always run in a gentlemanly and gracious way. Lee Atwater, who recant, I mean, he really repented and recanted and wrote a book and said he was sorry. Well, he, <laughs> Atwater. He, he told Life Magazine he was sorry, yeah. Yeah, told, yeah was it Life yeah, Magazine? Yeah. I mean, he, uh, after he got a, he had a brain tumor and yep. he was dying, yep. and, and I, I, there's several moments in in your life of Bush where this man of enormous sense of personal honor is willing 
to get his hands dirty sure with campaign dirty tricks and you you um I wouldn't say that you know that the pages vibrate or anything, but you struggled with with this element in his sure. character that this supremely honorable father husband uh, statesman sure. would would do that. Sure. Well, but no great political life is without those shadows. Uh, if you're looking for a great political life without those, you'll you'll, you'll end up in the realm of fiction pretty fast. Um, I think. Uh, at, at critical moments, uh, Iran Contra, uh, the conduct of the AA campaign, he made compromises and capitulations uh, to, and in some questions of party orthodoxy, uh, to win power in order to have the capacity to do what he was best at, which was to act with power. Right. And so my my test, I guess, is of a great political life is less what you do to win it than more what you do with it. Right. Um, well, that was his test for sure. Yeah, and I th but I think it's a fair one because yeah. I think in, in a fallen world, there's no other way to do it. No. Uh, or, as Robert Penn Warren taught us, you know, there's always something. <laughs> uh, there's always something. And you know, if you're looking for perfection, if you're looking for, uh, for uh, you know, a totally noble figure, I think you'll look in vain. His presidency, um, four years. <laughs> Actually, I get the strong impression from you that he was just as glad in some ways that it was four and not eight. It seemed like he was really tired. He was tired. He was suffering from Graves' disease, a thyroid yeah. condition that, uh, that was difficult. Um, didn't affect his fitness for office, but, but it affected his energy levels. Um, and he'd been running flat out since World War II. Since uh, he was 18. Yes. You yeah. know, so, yeah, no one had a right to be tired. Yeah, Jim Baker said that, told me, he said, you know, we were all just, we were all tired. Uh, of course. 12, you know, eight years as vice president, eight, four years as president, I mean, the end of the Cold War. Um, a lot of Americans, I, I think, I think I, I think I include myself, it's hard to remember exactly, but I had an impression, I would have, if, I, if someone had asked me six months ago about the Bush presidency, I might have said not much happened. Mm-hmm. But the USSR folded, the Berlin Wall came down, Germany was reunified, the coup plotters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, staged their up uprising in Moscow. Mm -hmm. It was... First it, Gulf War. And, and he ran and won uh, Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. It was a, a lot. It was eight years of action packed into four. <laughs> it was, wasn't it? Uh -huh. And then all these things successfully, in some ta some cases, brilliantly managed, and he loses yeah. re-election. Well, he knew instantly. Uh, the tide of the, his popularity at the Gulf War, uh, in the flush of that victory, that the election would be about the economy. Uh, he was ahead of the pundits, he was ahead of his own people. Uh, there was a mild, it was not a deep recession, but it was an anemic recovery. Um, and he was, all, he was living on borrowed historical time anyway. We had not had 12 years of one-party White House rule since Roosevelt and Truman. Uh, so eight on, eight off is the, was the norm. Right. And so the victory in 88 was anomalous. Uh, he mm -hmm. was the first sitting vice president since Martin Van Buren to succeed a sitting president. Uh, so to have gone 16 years, four national elections in a row, would have, been, that would have meant that Reagan and Bush were of a political caliber with Roosevelt and Truman. And I'm a, which was five elections, um, and I, I respect President Reagan and President Bush enormously, but but that was a different time. Um, so I think it, you know there, there there's a there's a tide in the affairs of men, uh, and I think that it was it was time uh, time for a party switch there, and it opened up the next chapter for the Bush family. I don't think either Bush brother could have run for governor while their father was president. Um, oh. There would have been a kind of conflict. Every every day would have been trying to get the governors to say something yeah, about the president. Exactly. And vice and vice versa. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I think it, that his his accomplishments there, um, I had to be reminded of them, and it was prudence that saw him through. It was. <laughs> it was. It was his his equanimity, his calm. Steady as she goes. Steady as she goes. And, and in this climate, uh, as we look at a 2016 field that's about as different from the, say, the 1988 field as you can imagine, um, you know, we've gone from, in 1988 and 1992, a Republican nominee who had a hard time speaking about himself 
to a front runner in 2016 who can talk about little else. Uh, so I, it's a little like what Henry Adams said about Washington to Grant disproved Darwin. I have a feeling that's what we're, we're seeing right now. Uh, I, I am astonished by what we see right now. <laughs> and, and tonight is another, tonight is another debate and we will see something else. I, I'm going to take it as certain that you're not writing a biography of Donald Trump, but, but I, I but at, at the moment, at the moment, <laughs> but, I never say never once. But I, I also take it as certain that you are writing another book. What are you doing now? Uh, well, I'm under spousal orders not to decide until the new year, oh. uh, which I figure is cheaper than a divorce. So uh, waiting, don't you think? Uh, you're deciding between what and what? Uh, I've thought about President Eisenhower. I've thought, uh -huh. of, I've thought about President Lincoln in the broad political career. So there are, there are possibilities. I'm doing my reading and, uh, and we'll decide sometime early in the year. And I won't ask you who's gonna win the, 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 uh, the, the nominations oh. or the presidency, but I will ask you about George H.W. From his present position ranked among presidents, do you think that that position in the near future will be will rise? Will people think more of him soon than they do at present? I do. I think he's you a do. consequential president. I think uh, you know the the case I make has gotten some attention, and I think uh, uh, has I hope helped shape a burgeoning historical conversation about him. Uh, I think he will go down as one of the two most consequential one-term presidents with James K. Polk. Um, and arguably, in many ways, as important. Again, presidents don't always get the credit they deserve for keeping bad things from happening. And to, <laughs> have, right. and to have ended the Cold War without firing a shot right. is a remarkable achievement. And if that's what, uh, if Bill Clinton's right that you only get remembered for, you know, at best two or three things, George Bush won the first Gulf War, uh, broke read my lips, and ended the Cold War. And so that's... I, you know, well, I'd th take that. That's the nice thing about these kinds of predictions. It, we'll all live long enough to see. Well, as, <laughs> okay. or, or as John Maynard Kane said, in the long run, we'll all be dead. <laughs> there is that also. <laughs> I've enjoyed this conversation so much. And when you do decide, and when you do write the next one, I hope you come back, and I hope we can sit down and I'd talk again. To. I'd love to. Love being here. Been a pleasure. Thanks, Tom.